give thanks that we can come before you today to hear your word, and to follow your words, to allow them to be poured into our hearts, to give us understanding, but most of all, to give us love one for the other. Bless the words of my mouth, that they indeed be yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I call this, and they follow. Jesus Christ, when he was here, he went about the earth gathering disciples, gathering followers, people who would hear his word and follow his word and do marvelous and wonderful things. We are called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And there are different ways of following. When we go shopping with a friend, sometimes we can just follow them in and out of the stores. We can follow people on the highway hoping they don't go into a ditch. But in this particular case, it means to follow somebody as a soldier would follow their commanding officer, with diligence, with perseverance, with hope, with faith, with trust, and with loyalty. You know, my grandfather, John Stephen, followed John Molson. They were in the war together. They served together. And so my grandfather knew what it meant to follow. And so did your great, 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 and so on, grandfather, knew how to follow, because they were both men of God as well. And we are called to gather and to follow the word of God, and to follow with one another. And that's what Jesus is doing, is he's going about the world, the known world, and he's gathering people to follow him. And he meets somebody by the name of Matthew, who's sitting at a tax booth. Matthew was hired by the government to collect taxes. In a sense, he was his own businessman. And yet Jesus called him, and he went and he spent time with this tax collector and many other tax collectors and other business people. But the church of that day shunned him. But as Jesus said, I've not come for those who do not need help, but I've come for those who are. And when he uses this term sick, it means having evil, but not evil as an evil person, but that evil is surrounding them. And each of us, from time to time, evil will come upon us in sickness and worry and anxiety and the things of life. And what God is asking us to do when he says, go and learn what this means, it means the statement he's asking us to learn is, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He desires that we have an inquiring mind through experience to learn what it means to have mercy and not sacrifice. To have mercy is that feeling of sympathy, sympathy with misery, to have an active compassion, desire of relieving the miserable and prompting by distress. We are each called to do that as we follow Jesus Christ. As Henry follows in the word of Jesus Christ by his family bringing him here today, Perhaps he didn't follow, he led them here today. But we are all following in the word of God to have this love of God, because that's what it means when Jesus is quoting this text, he's quoting from Hosea 6.6, 6, where Hosea said, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. This love is kindness, especially as that that's extended to the lowly, the needy, and the miserable. So we have come to follow the word of Christ, to follow a baptismal covenant to love one another with a particular kindness. And this kindness brings healing in so many ways. And Jesus explains this in what he does where he's sitting with his friends, he's sitting with the tax collectors, and somebody comes and says, my daughter has died, will you come? And Jesus follows him, and he goes to see the daughter, and everybody's laughing at him because they say the daughter's dead. They've even called the funeral homes, and they're having the the music and the dancing. And Jesus says, step aside. I will raise her up. I will make her whole. And on the way, he meets a woman who just wants to touch the cloak of Jesus Christ. And sometimes just by opening the Bible and reading the word of God, we are touching the cloak of Jesus Christ to allow that word to come into ourselves. And that is why we come to follow Jesus Christ in the baptismal covenants that we'll honor today. And what does Jesus say? Take heart, take courage. He's using the same words that Moses said to his people when their backs were up against the oceans and up against the big rock. Take courage, do not be afraid, stand firm, 
and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish with you today. This promise, this promise that we have called to become a great nation. Abram was called with a promise to become a great nation. He was told by God to go to that land of promise, to create a great nation. And when he was sent, he was already a man of particular age, 75 years of age. That's only in a couple of years, Brian. It's not that old. And he took his wife, Sarah. And at that age, how could he hope, except by the promise of God, that he would be the father of many great nations? Because as it says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And what did he do? He gave thanks to God. He built an altar. He couldn't go to the local Anglican church. He had to build his own church to give thanks to God. Giving thanks to God for something that has not happened yet. We are giving thanks to God today for something that has not happened yet in the life of Henry and his big sister Charlotte. And in each and every one of us here today, gathered to receive the promise, the promise of God to become a great nation. And we hear about this promise as it unfolds in Romans, where Paul is speaking to the Romans about this promise of faith, this righteousness that comes from faith, of hope and of believing. Therefore, the faith of Abraham, see, it's a name changer. His name has been changed from Abram to Abraham. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as a righteousness. You see, in Genesis 17.15, Genesis 17.5, rather, it speaks of Abram, and the word Abram means an exalted ancestor. But later his name is changed to Abraham, which means an ancestor of a multitude. When he was realized that he would become the father of a great nation, even his name changed. Before him to become the father of a great nation, his wife, Sarah, had to have her name changed as well to Sarah. Because Sarah, she's introduced in Genesis 11, where she is known as Sarah was barren. And even at those ages of being barren, how could she give birth to nations to come? But in Genesis 17, 15, the promise comes to Abraham. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. It's a name changer. And we think, well, this is fine. This happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. But it did not, did it not happen in the 1700s. When a young man came from Lincolnshire and he came to discover a new land and a new nation with promise that he took his inheritance and he put it all into his business of supporting this land and people. And then he met a woman by the name of Sarah. And the two, John and Sarah, formed this great nation of people becoming benevolent with true love of philanthropy, of building businesses, building hospitals, building railroads, building hotels, caring for people, gathering people together in venues to celebrate a brew, yes, but gathering people together to be one with the other, to support one another. And all was with the thought and the idea of giving thanks to God out of righteousness. You see, this name, this identity, this logos is so important. Sometimes it becomes a biography, but our identity is something deeper. It is our love and it's our spirituality that comes forth in what we do and how we do so many different things. So that's why I believe today is such an important day as we gather looking at our heritage that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, but not too far beyond to our own lives and our own heritage and our own names and the importance of our names and where we come from and who we're named after. 
and that promise in that name. And the text that we can read. I love verse 7 of Psalm 33. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle, and he put the deeps in storehouses. Did you catch that one? Some of you did. <laughs> I believe that the counsel of the Lord stands forever, as it says in verse 11. The thoughts of the heart are to all generations, all of the generations here today. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And today we have cher cherished and chosen the heritage of God, the word of God in our lives for the generations that have been, the generations that are, and the many generations to come from Henry, from Charlotte, and so many others who have come in the name of the Lord to be witnesses to our Lord. Amen.